It's now a great pleasure of mine to introduce our speaker for, for this convocation. Uh, our speaker is Dr. David J. Triggle. David is both a, holds a university professor and a SUNY distinguished professor uh, rank from the State University of New York, two of the university's highest academic ranks. Professor Triggle received his education in the United Kingdom with a PhD degree in chemistry from the University of Hull and following postdoctoral experience at the University of Ottawa and the University of London, he assumed a faculty position at the School of Pharmacy. This year, he is celebrating his 50th year as a faculty member at this university, and I'd like to congratulate him on his longevity and to his contributions to our university and to our school. Dr. Triggle currently is teaching courses in bioethics and science policy. He is engaged in the Center for Scientific Inquiry, a think tank in Western, in Amherst, New York, devoted to the study of the advancement of science. And he is a contributor, a major contributor to the Master of Education program, Science in the Public, at the Graduate School of Education. <laughs> Professor Striegel's teaching activities are, ex are extensive, and he's been engaged in medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, and research ethics and he's delivered research seminars and lectures worldwide. I could go on listing some of his accolades, but let me just summarize a few, a few key points uh, in, in this distinguished career. Uh, Professor Triggle is the author of three books dealing with the autonomic nervous system and drug, recenter, drug receptor interaction. He is editor of a few dozen more books and approximately 300, uh, and has published over 300 peer-reviewed papers 150 chapters and reviews, and he's presented over 1,000 invited lectures worldwide. He is a senior editor of Comprehensive Medicinal Chemistry and Elsevier Publication Series, uh, and the Institute of Science and Information lists him as one of the 100 most published, most cited authors in pharmacology in the world. That's an incredible achievement. His principal research has been in the area of ion channels and the chemical pharmacolo uh, chem pharmacology of drugs interacting with the ion channels. He's received many honors, including uh, Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Volweiler Research Award from the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, the Education Citation Award from the National Columbus Day Committee, the George Koff Award from the Medical Foundation of Buffalo, and the Otto Crayer Award of the American Society of Pharmacology and, and Experimental Therapeutics. He has chaired national conferences. Uh, he has served on educational subcommittees, chaired subcommittees, and go on and on and on. He has been instrumental in establishing and helping establish uh, educational institutions in Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, China, India. Holds honorary degrees from a number of institutions, including University of Camerino in Italy, University of Hull, in the UK, University of Nanjing in China, and today wearing the robes of his honorary law degree from the University of Padua in, in Italy. I am proud to introduce David Triggle as a scholar, member of our faculty, and a friend. Well, since this is my last official function at the university, Dean Anderson very kindly gave me permission to speak for several hours. <laughs> but I won't do that. I will tell you a story about my recent travels. Recently, I traveled to San Francisco to speak at a meeting on new drug development. And as I left the hotel, it was raining very, very heavily, and I got into the cab to the airport, and the cab driver was a very aggressive driver indeed. And he pulled right into a funeral car procession, which was obviously he heading to a cemetery or church, and he slipped right in behind the funeral car. And as we went up one hill and down the other on the streetcar tracks in San Francisco, with the rain making the curbs, making the roads very slippery and greasy, he went over a large pothole on the top of one hill, and the back door of the funeral car broke, broke open, and the coffin slipped out onto the streetcar tracks. My driver was very aggressive and sounded his horn and tried to uh, push the coffin to the side, but to no avail. The coffin generated increasing momentum and went down the hill on the streetcar tracks and gained sufficient momentum to actually get, go up the streetcar tracks on the next hill. 
As it went over the hill, the streetcar tracks turned abruptly left and the coffin could not navigate them. It went straight down a short cul-de-sac and went into the plate grass window of a pharmacy. And as it did so, the coffin broke open and a corpse sat up and said, please can you give me something to stop this coffin? Well, that's not really true, is it? <laughs> but there is a lesson there. Um, please, can you give me something to stop this coffin? That tells us something about the administration of medicines and drugs. How many times have we gone to the physician who says, try this, if this doesn't work, add this. If that doesn't work, try this. Increasingly, we are entering a brave new world, however where the choice of medicines will be increasingly driven by our knowledge of the relationship between disease and genetics, where we will be better able to fit disease, the patient, and the drug together in a more effective way, genetically driven medicine. Here is what was written by one of the leaders in the Human Genome Project only yesterday in a major scientific journal, and I quote, successfully navigating a course from the base pairs of the human genome sequence to the bedside of patients would seem to be within reach, would usher in an era of genomic medicine, would fulfill the promise originally envisioned in the Human Genome Project, and most importantly, would benefit all humankind. But we're not there yet. And indeed, many have expressed frustration and disappointment concerning promises made and not yet fulfilled in this field. Yet it's probably worth remembering that the Human Genome Project is in reality well over a century old already. It was started by a humble Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel, cultivating peas in his monastery garden, by Oswald Avery in 1944, who at Rockefeller Institute proved that DNA was the unit of heredity, to Francis Crick and James Watson, who deciphered the structure of DNA and pointed out its copying mechanism, to Hamilton Smith and others, who discovered the tools of recombinant biology. Science is always an incremental discipline. It builds on the work of others. It was Isaac Newton, probably the greatest English scientist of all time, who said, if, if I have seen further than other men, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. And so it is with the progress of science. There is a certain inevitability about science, and there is an inevitability to the progress of genomic medicine. But, as Hamlet said in his famous and celebrated soliloquy, aye, there's the rub. How can we ensure that the promise of this new medicine is actually delivered. We live in an unequal society in an unequal world. And science and medicine can only deliver what the social and political infrastructure permits. And that infrastructure is too frequently broken or non-existent. Yesterday, the Office of Management and Budget in the United States reported that we in the United States currently spend almost $20,000 per year per family on health insurance. And that's increasing at the rate of 7 to 10 percent per year, which means by the year 2021, the cost will be approximately $40,000. By 2031, it will be approximately $80,000. By the year 2041, $160,000. I can go on. But clearly, this extrapolation is sheer madness because it's absolutely non-sustainable. So the roughly 20% of GDP that we spend today on healthcare will increase dramatically. And in fact, this is entirely a non-sustainable enterprise. Now, it would be worth spending this sum of money if in fact we generated the best health, health outcomes in the world. But currently, the United States ranks number 26 in infant mortality and number 36 in adult longevity in the world. So we spend the most money, often by factors of two to three to fourfold, and we do not achieve the greatest overall health outcomes in the world. This clearly is a non-sustainable process. Something is wrong, and unless we radically transform our healthcare delivery system, medicines from genomic-based medicines will only be available to a very privileged and rich few. I know of no all-encompassing simple solution to this. I studied Latin and Greek in a classical education at school, and you may well think those are not terribly important subjects to study. They aren't. 
but it did allow me to memorize the names of all the Greek gods and all the mythology associated with the Greek gods. Asclepius was the Greek god of medicine. He was a son of Apollo and Coronis, and his two older daughters were Hygieia, from which we derived the word hygiene, and panacea, from which we derived the word universal remedy. And from this, we actually derive the two components of medicine, prevention and cure. And in the United States and throughout much of the world, we pay very little attention to preventive medicine. We pay too little attention to the debilitating effects of poverty, lack of childcare, to the impact of cheap food and living conditions. We have the highest percentage of adults living in poverty in the developed world, the highest percentage of children living in poverty in the, in the developed world, the largest prison population in the world, and California, for example, spends more on its prison system than it does on higher education. We have a major challenge in matching the promise of science and medicine to the social conditions in which we operate in the United States and throughout the world. The United Nations yesterday reported that the anticipated world population by 2100 will be between 10.1 and 10.5 billion. That's four billion people more on Earth in the end of this century than exists today. That represents an enormous challenge to the delivery of healthcare, not just in the United States, but also in the rest of the world. It's a challenge that this class is going to have to be part of generating the solution for. It is a major challenge. Science and medicine can deliver, but the social policies under which we administer science and medicine need to be adjusted to the hopeful outcomes that science and medicine can produce for all of us. I was tempted to begin this talk by citing Woody Allen's celebrated speech to the graduating class, and I quote, he said, today we stand at a crossroads. One road leads to despair and utter hopelessness, and the other to total extinction. Let us pray that we have the wisdom to choose the correct road. Uh, there is, of course, always a third road, and this is the road that this class and the graduating class at this university are going to have to find for all of us. They're going to have to find it and to explore so that the benefits of science and medicine and pharmaceutical sciences are going to be available universally as part of the scientific intellectual commons that belongs to all of us. Let me finish by quoting some words from my favorite poet, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. If men could learn from history what lessons it might teach us, but passion and party blind our eyes, and the light which experience gives us is but a lantern on the stern, illuminating only the waves behind us. To the class of 2011, we wish you success in exploring the paths ahead, because our future depends on your future and your progress. Congratulations. <laughs>